Well, good Wednesday morning to you, church. It's good to see you this morning, and uh, looking forward to uh, our lesson this morning, Galatians lesson number eight. And uh, we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter four, lesson, uh, excuse me, uh, verse eight, down through the end of the chapter, Lord willing. And so last week we saw where Paul challenged the Galatian believers with regard to their adoption, being adopted into God's family as an adult son, which reminds us that we're to be responsible sons. Amen? Uh, when we reach age, uh, an age of accountability and we are uh, able to enjoy the privileges of being in the family of God and uh, we now have the privilege of enjoying those benefits because we're adopted as adult sons, an infant child doesn't necessarily realize the benefit from a well-to-do father uh, until he comes of age. Uh, of course, uh, infant sons oftentimes are treated pretty well if they have, an, a, have a well-to-do father, but to really experience the fullness of it uh, doesn't happen until they get a little bit older. So, But we Christians have been adopted with full privileges associated with being in God's family, and so we are thankful for that, you know, upon our salvation, we become part of the royal priesthood. Uh, that's an important uh, understanding for us to know about because being part of the royal priesthood gives us rights and privileges to approach the throne of grace. Uh, we don't need a man to intercede on our behalf. We can go directly to God ourselves, and uh, we have the ability, uh, ability to minister God's grace to those we come into contact with and through our testimony of Christ living in us. You know, Paul also mentioned that in the fullness of time, God sent forth our Savior. Uh, that's a pretty important thing to remember as well, because it wasn't in our time. It wasn't when we said it should be. It wasn't when we determined it. It's when God said, it's time. And so in the fullness of time, God sent forth his only begotten Son for the full purpose of redeeming all who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, bar none. Anyone who chooses to believe on Christ can be saved. And his finished work on the cross of Calvary becomes a reality for those who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we told you on Sunday morning during our salvation series that once a person accepts and truly understands, uh, begins to see the, uh, the entirety of God's word, and it sends conviction on their heart, and they willingly accept the truths that they see and begin to make them real in their life and heart, uh, God miraculously regenerates their spirit and they become alive, able to respond to the things of God. So today in our study, we're looking at Galatians chapter 4 verses 8 through 11 is where we'll start out. <clears throat> the Bible says, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? Whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years? I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul was deeply concerned about the Galatian believers because they had strayed away from the things that he had taught. And here he confronts the Galatian Christians with all with an all-important decision. He asks them this simple question, are you going to go backwards into bondage, or are you going to go forward? Uh, it's a choice that we make every day uh, whether or not we're going to uh, follow the Lord Jesus Christ and continue to move forward, the gods of this world or the God of heaven. And if you decide on the God of heaven, we look forward into the future. All of the things in the past are in the past, according to the Scriptures. And so Paul, uh, his statement in verses 8 and 9, when he says, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. You know, there's sure a lot of things in this world that we give a whole lot of credit to that really have no business in our lives uh, dictating anything at all to us. But yet we've become conditioned many times by the world and the world's philosophy, and we sometimes find ourselves caught up in it without even realizing it. But the Bible says here, but now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? <clears throat> again, those, that word elements is in there. And Paul, we remember last week we talked about that word elements. It's almost like 
uh, you know, you've graduated and you've moved on and yet you want to go back to the ABCs. Paul draws a believer's attention to an all-important fact. He says, before Paul came with a testimony of Christ, the Galatians were simply doing what everyone else was doing. Isn't that the truth today? When you go out into society, people are basically following other people, uh, simply following the world's ways and the world's gods. And many, and many times, just because they think that's what you're supposed to do. But the Bible has something else to give us. Paul comes uh, to them with a message of Christ, and he shares a more excellent way. God's way is excellent. It's the most excellent way. He then reminds them of the benefits of knowing God. The bondage seems natural when we don't know God. In other words, when you don't know anything else uh, about what God offers us in our life as a human being, uh, when we don't know anything about God, what, why wouldn't we do what the world does? But you see, Paul had brought the truth to the Galatian believers, and he had shown them a more excellent way. Once you've been born again into the family of God, being in bondage uh, you know, uh, to dead worldly gods makes no sense. Once you've been born in and you've been set free uh, to live a life of, of, uh, of joy and, and uh, uh, being able to serve God and all those things, why in the world would we want to go back into bondage again? Man will always do what comes natural in his lost state. Uh, but once he's saved, he has a different way. And Paul reminds them of their, of their position in Christ. Notice what Paul says in those verses that I just read. He says, it's, it, it's great that you know God, but it's more, much more important that God knows you. And that's the key. If God truly knows you, he desires an intimate relationship with you, one that will grow stronger day by day. And as time goes on, our relationship should get stronger. That's why I've told you at the beginning of this year that our personal spiritual health is our personal responsibility. Uh, we have work to do, and uh, God calls on us to do that work. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, we see a, we see a stark reminder of this principle that we're talking about, about knowing God and He knowing us. Uh, it's critical that God knows us, and that you have a testimony of being in Christ. Matthew 7, verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils in thy name, done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You know, that's a pretty sobering statement because there's many people in our world who are religious, but they don't have the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Or if they do, they're not displaying any of the characteristics of a person who is in Christ. Uh, this is the age-old question. Why, after being born into the family of God with all the eternal benefits, would you go backwards? In turning back, the Galatians were not doing something new. They were simply following an age-old problem, uh, you know, uh, being confused. Uh, we use the word bewitched a number of times in this lesson series. That's what the Judaizers were doing to the Galatians. And many today in the church have a major setback. If they have a major setback in their life, they turn back to the world. Uh, that's why it's so critical to have a church family and a pastor that you can go to for counseling, biblical counseling. Uh, Christians have no business going to the world for answers. Why in the world would a child of God go to the world that they've left to come into the family of God? Why would they go back into a bondage situation? Because that's what it's going to turn into. Uh, most counseling today that the world offers is, is about drugs and prescription medication and all these other things uh, with the thought that they'll help. But the problem is once they start these medications into a person, they never come off of them. See, that's the world's bondage, uh, dragging you back into a place that you need not go. Uh, but many in the church, when they suffer a setback, that's where they head. They head to the world for their answers. They may not you know, do all the same things that the world does, but oftentimes it's a turning back. 
That's why you see families and people leave the church when something tough happens to them. You know, in verses 10 and 11, Paul calls out some of what they were turning back to. Notice what he says. Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Going backward to a works-based salvation serves no purpose whatsoever. It cannot save anybody. It, it rewards the believer nothing. You get no benefit by going back to bondage and into the law and into the uh, putting yourself under the law. There's no benefit there for you. All it does is condemns you as guilty before a holy God. Think about it. If we purchased, if we were purchased out of slavery and given a new home with a rich father, why in the world would we desire to go back into slavery? <laughs> no one in their right mind would do that. No clear-thinking person would ever do that kind of a thing. Uh, but yet, remember, uh, Paul used the word bewitch. Uh, the, the false Judaizers had cast a spell over the believers. Uh, they had grabbed their ear and got their attention, and they had just the right words, and, and they were able to say just the right things. And before you know it, the Galatian believers were headed off the track into the wrong area once again. They had bewitched them. The devil, by the way, is a master deceiver. He's much smarter than you and I. We need to understand as Christians that in and of ourselves, we think sometimes we have things figured out. But in truth, the devil is a master deceiver. Uh, he's smarter than you and I. And uh, if we try to take him on by ourselves, we are going to lose every time. So what we do is said, we call on the Lord Jesus Christ for our help. Paul goes on in verse 11 and he says, I'm afraid of you. You know, a Christian that has been separated uh, from God's truth and instead is following false doctrine uh, is, 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 is headed for a serious consequence. When we get off the track and we start following a false teacher, we are in trouble and we need to take a, an abrupt 180 degree turn and head back towards the things of God as fast as we can because therein is our safety in our Christian life. You know, people say that the Bible is a crutch. Uh, they say that Christians have to have the Bible as their crutch. Well, the truth is, the Bible, the Word of God, is the Christian's lifeblood. It's what keeps us on the narrow road. Uh, it's our roadmap to righteousness. It's a roadmap to the things of God. It's a roadmap to the person of Christ. And we need to be on that, map, on that roadmap constantly, every day of our life. Paul was concerned that his labor would be, was turning to nothing. In other words, he was do, what he had done for the Galatian believers, he thought that it was turning into uh, something that was vain. It had no truth. No, it was empty. Not because he hadn't told them the truth, but because they were you know, making it of none effect by not following it. Listen, Christians, when we hear God's word and we make it of none effect in our lives... We are doing ourselves a total disservice. That's why it's so important that we stick to the Word of God and all the principles and precepts that it provides us. In verses 12 through 15, Paul calls them out for what he knew them to be in time past. Listen, brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, he despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. You know, that kind of leads us to believe that maybe that firmity in the flesh that Paul suffered from had to do with his eyes. I don't know. The Bible doesn't clearly tell us. But there was a time, Paul said, not long ago, where you thought I was an angel sent from God. Uh, you looked at me and you said, thank God that he's here to tell us the truth. You know, many preachers have asked themselves that same question. You voted me in as your pastor, and now after preaching to you, I get looked upon as the bad guy, or as an enemy of you as a believer. It, it's, it's really, when you think about it, it's kind of silly, but... My responsibility as pastor is to teach you the Word of God as best I know how, based as I study and pray and, and God leads me to teach and, and tell you the things that I 
that I share and tell you about from the Word of God. And Paul told him this, even when I was sick, he said, I continued to preach and teach uh, those life-saving messages of the gospel. And yet now, Galatian believers, you're basically making those messages that I gave you, the truth that I brought to you, even when I was sick and not in my full uh, capacity, I still continued. And now you're taking all of that and you're just casting it aside. You know, there's a lot of believers who, under the right circumstances, will take what they have heard, they'll take the things that they've committed to their heart and life at one point in their life, and they'll just cast them aside when something happens that they don't think should happen or uh, they don't know how to handle it. Uh, instead of just uh, praying and asking God's help and going to godly counselors, they just cast aside what they've already known. That's something that I'll never understand. Why in the world would a believer that's in Christ cast aside that life-saving knowledge that they have? Uh, Paul encouraged them to be like him. Now listen, Paul wasn't saying, hey, I'm all of that in a bag of chips. You know, he wasn't bragging on himself. Uh, he wasn't saying that he was perfect and sinless. Paul was telling them to follow him as he followed Jesus. And by the way, that's our responsibility, to follow Jesus. Uh, we're to imitate Christ in all manner of living. And the Galatians had started out on the right foot. They had started out with what Paul had taught them. They had the right understanding. But the problem is they had allowed themselves to be led astray. Now, in any group of people, there's going to be those who are led astray easily. There's going to be those who are, takes a little bit more to lead them astray. And then there's going to be those in the same group that will stick to the things that they've heard. We see that manifest itself in the church on a regular basis. Some people are easily led astray. Others maybe it takes a little bit more. But there's always people who have stuck to what they were taught when they were first born into the family of God. And that's where we need to be. Now, that doesn't mean as we grow and we learn and we study, we, our understanding sometimes is changed of certain things, and that's fine. But the truth is the fundamental facts of our salvation never change. The Galatians had started out on the right foot, but they had been led astray. Could it be, question, could it be, this is still happening in our churches today, people who started out right, but did not stay in the faith. Now, in some cases, they were never truly born again, and I believe their lifestyle bears that out. Now, you say, well, lifestyle doesn't determine a person's salvation. Well, no, it sure doesn't. But there's plenty of verses in the Bible that show us that a person who's truly born again and in the family of God has a certain characteristic about them or characteristics. And there's people today that claim Christ that have none of those characteristics. Uh, that's not my word. That's just what their evidence in their life shows. God will sort that out one day. But Paul was free in Jesus. He understood what it meant to be free from the bondage of the law. And he was free in Christ. And he wanted the Galatian believers to be free also. It should be the testimony of every believer to be able to say to the lost, be like me. I'm, not, I'm so satisfied with my Christian life, there's nothing I'd rather be than a Christian. Not saying be like me because I'm hot stuff. No, be like me because I'm a child of God and there's nothing better in this world than being a child of God. That should be our testimony. And it should make us different. This is not an arrogant statement. It's just a statement of Paul's contentment that he gave to the, Galat the Galatian believers. And Paul intimates that the believers at Galatia would have done anything in the beginning for him. But yet all of a sudden, many of them were quickly being led astray. It's the same principle of today's Christians who upon their salvation would have done most anything for God. But here's what happens. In the beginning, you have the testimony that you'd be willing to do anything for God, yet now they've come into their comfort zones. After time has passed and, you know, the newness of salvation has sort of worn a little bit thin, believers oftentimes go into a, a place called their comfort zone. And now when God lays a burden on their heart, they find, way, find a way to dismiss it or to uh, pretend like obedience to God is no longer important and it no longer matters to God. That's a terrible place to be as a child of God. Uh, Paul says that uh, here that 
he was questioning whether the, the Galatian believers had truly believed at all because they were so soon, uh, so soon removed from the things that he had taught. And I think that, that is true in some circumstances. Sometimes people are in that position, but not always. But he was questioning whether they had truly believed at all. In verses 21 through 31, we see that Paul is going to appeal to the law for those who desire to be under the law. And it's almost like Paul is saying, look, you, you love the law so much. Let me tell you a few things about the law, and let's see if you still love it after I'm done telling you these things. If you place yourself under the law, Paul said, it is what you do for God that pleases him. But under the grace of God, what I had taught you, the gospel of grace, the, the freedom in Christ, it is, is what he has done for us. And as we respond to what he's done for us, therein lies the secret to a contentment and a contentment in a Christian life. We simply receive what God has done. In our salvation series on Sunday, we're talking about predestination. We're talking about uh, regeneration. We're talking about justification, sanctification, glorification. And, and what I want you to understand about those five things Everything that happens in our life because of those five things is of the Lord. God does all of those things. We just receive those good things that he's done for us. We're going to talk about sanctification this coming Sunday, but uh, we need to understand it's of God. He is the one that does it. We just receive it. You know, it's been said that the law, the law uh, is the road that guides us. Not the road that drives, uh, not the rod that drives us. In other words, the law is profitable to us. I mean, it gives us the standard that God uh, wants in our lives in many cases, but it's not supposed to be a a, a beating stick over us. Uh, you know, every time we make a mistake, somebody beats us over the head with the law. No, it should be just a roadmap. It's a roadmap to show us uh, what righteousness looks like, what God is like, gives us the attributes of God. And Paul knew that the Galatian believers were still not receiving the point about the law yet. Even though he was discussing it and giving them examples and trying to articulate the principles. So he decided to use another illustration. It was as if Paul was going to conduct a Bible study with these Galatian believers. He went to Galatia, or excuse me, he went to Genesis chapter 16 and he explains the story of Abraham, Hagar, and Sarah. Paul was going to show them that they had not handled the Bible correctly in their thinking. The Judaizers had mishandled the word of God. And he would prove to them that a true understanding of the law of Moses would completely support the gospel that he had preached. It would support it. It wouldn't do it away. It wouldn't take make it of none effect. It would basically, it would support the gospel he was now preaching. And in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 22 and 23, we see a contrast between Abraham's two sons. One was by a bondmaid, the second from a free woman. The Judaizers who were bewitching the Galatians protested that they were children of Abraham. Paul admitted that they were children of Abraham, but Paul goes on and also reminds them that Abraham had two sons. Abraham's first son was named Ishmael, and he was born with a mother who was a servant. Remember, this is when Sarah and Abraham decided they would help God out. Uh, they were not content in just believing God's promise to give them the son that they had wanted and asked for. So they decided to try to help God. And uh, Abraham went into unto, unto his handmaiden, or the servant Hagar, and they conceived and, and she gave birth to a son called Ishmael. So Paul draws the first distinction here and contrast between uh, the free woman and the bond woman. Uh, the, the freeness of Christianity according to the gospel message of Christ and the slavery of the bondage of the law. By using a bondwoman and a free woman, that's what they had done. Uh, there was a contrast, and that's there for us as a picture. Christians are free in Christ. They're not under the law. Uh, therefore, Ishmael was born out of unbelief. What was the unbelief? It was the unbelief by Sarah and Abraham that God was going to answer and do what he had promised them he would do. Remember, he had promised Abraham way back that he would basically give him a son and that his son would continue to grow and many nations, all nations of the earth would be blessed because of that covenant that he made with Abraham. 
And so when that didn't happen in the time frame that Abraham and Sarah thought it should, they took it upon themselves to try to help God out. And consequently, Ishmael was born out of unbelief, born according to the flesh, trying to make a way for yourself, working for God's favor. Living by the law is living by your flesh, trusting in your flesh that you will do the right thing. Hey, every one of us knows that if that's what we're trying to do in our Christian life, to be right before God, we're going to fail every time. Why? Because we don't have the ability in and of ourselves to do the things that God wants us to do. That's why it's so important to trust in Christ. Legalism in its true form is not about setting standards. It's about worshiping the standards. You know, there's many churches today that worship standards over the freedom in Christ. Here at Faith Baptist Church, we try to hold the standard that we believe the Bible teaches but we never want to be in a position to worship the standards that we have put in place. Uh, they're not our standards, they're God's standards, and we should just try our best to abide by those standards, not worship them. And so judging other believers on those standards instead of by Christ's example is what we're oftentimes guilty of. Now, I have you know, no, uh, uh, no tolerance for false teachers, of course, and neither should you, but there are some times that people do make mistakes. Sometimes people make mistakes in their theology and then they go back and they correct it. And, and uh, Spurgeon is one of those. Uh, we think of him uh, as an independent Baptist, which I believe he was. Uh, and, and he said this, the more legalist a man is, the surer he will be damned. You know, Spurgeon had a transformation in his life. He didn't start out on the right theology. He started out with some Calvinistic doctrines, but yet later in his life he got those things squared away and he got them straight. You know, Isaac was the son born to Abraham and Sarah out of the promise from God, a son based on faith and God's miracle. And that's what we have God to be thankful for today because he not only sent Abraham and Sarah that promised son, but he also sent us as humans his promised son in the person of Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 4 and verses 24 through 27, the Bible says, Which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of all of us. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry that thou travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Mount Sinai in Jerusalem also shows us a contrast. Mount Sinai is where Moses received the law. This covenant gives birth to the bondage since it all, it's all about what we must do to be accepted by God. But the law required an annual sacrifice every year. Uh, every year the high priest had to go into the tabernacle and then the temple to uh, make a sacrifice and and uh, apply the blood to the mercy seat but this covenant is associated with Hagar and surrogate mother therefore it's associated with Galatians 4:23 but the covenant on Jerusalem that now is is focused on the future Mount Zion it's associated with the new Jerusalem the Jerusalem above is freedom it's free based on Jesus every born again uh, Christian belongs to this covenant. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, been born again into the family of God, you have been set free. And the Bible says the mother of us all. Every birth under this covenant is a miracle of grace. Verses 28 through 31. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. That promise that God made to Abraham that he would provide him a son. And then eventually would come the Lord Jesus. But as then he was that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. As Christians, the law is simply a set of guides for us to know. We're to know what it is that pleases God according to his word. It's not a rod of correction every time. In other words, we don't use this Bible to be a rod of correction, but we use it as a guide. 
uh, and we follow what it says. We don't deviate from it. We follow it exactly as it says. Uh, so it keeps us within the boundaries of righteousness that God wants us to be in. We are free to live a life that is pleasing in the Father's sight. Let's be about that as time marches on. Let's find out what it is God desires of each of us on an individual basis. And let's get busy at finding our place in the program that God has set forth in our lives. I believe it's the happiest place to be. There's no greater joy than to know that a man is in Christ. And that's what our focus should be on as we move forward in this new day. Next week we'll go into chapter number 5 of the book of Galatians. And on that note, we'll see you uh, this coming Sunday at 9.30 for Sunday school, 10.30 for worship. And uh, remember to pray for those in our church who are in need. Pray for Sister Bonnie with her, uh, her back uh, and neck problem that she's experiencing, that, the God, that God would give her grace. Pray for Teresa today. She is undergoing surgery today, this morning, uh, to deal with some health issues she has. So please lift her up in prayer if you would. And we'll look forward to seeing you Sunday morning at 9.30 right here at Faith Baptist Church. Have a great rest of your week.